Narita regarded the jar of small titanium white discs she had been given by her supervisor. Despite being an office worker, she had been instructed to deliver the catalyst membranes to one of the maintenance workers on this platform. Just one more pointless task to send the new girl on, she reflected bitterly. She was lost among the bioreactors, towering glass columns that bubbled with dense olive green growth while parasitic inspection drones crawled over them. The platform was one of the upper levels of the algae farm, suspended high above the sea on lattices of steel and plastic. The gentle swell of water far below, calmed by large tidal baffles that skirted the complex, made her unsteady on her feet. Beneath the water, the Nutrex Biological and Pharmaceutical Company grew a forest of genetically enhanced kelp. At nearly 400 feet high, the giant algae colored the water a ruddy green that stretched to the horizon. A gull drone circled above, luring seagulls away from the rig's more delicate structures. What am I doing? Narita muttered quietly to herself. She felt like throwing the damn jar in the water and just leaving. Would anyone notice? Or even care? Probably not, she thought. Brushing her fingertips across her wristband, she brought up a projection of her user interface, scanned the view through her glasses, and immediately uploaded the pictures to her profile. The view was probably the only thing that kept her in this shitty job. In a city of overbearing towers, dense masses of people, and lattices of freeways and tubeways, being on the Nutrex platform was one of the few places she could go to find open space that wasn't just a virtual experience moderated by AI or supervised by insurance drones and green police. Narita brought up the floor plan for this level of the plantation and double-checked the location of the engineer who was to receive the box. He appeared as a green dot within a spiderweb of thin blue lines that represented the catwalks and bioreactors. She kept the image up in her left lens and followed the beacon into the forest of bubbling glass steel pillars. They were installed in long rows with catwalks running in between. It was like walking in a field of tall crops. Well, they were crops, Narita mused. Though the reactors generated electricity and biofuel, the algae itself was harvested by Nutrex and turned into cheap foods and mass-produced disposable goods, selling crap for poor people to eat, and selling even more crap for poor people to break and throw out. Things might seem affordable, but they needed constant replacing or fixing. It was a false economy, and it was hard to avoid. Since moving into the city, Narita's meals had consisted of flavored Nutri, trademark, the very crap that Nutrex manufactured. It was bland and textureless and rarely tasted anything like what the packaging said it would, but at least the meals were nutritious and convenient. Her corporate-owned apartment was subsidized by NBP and came fully furnished, but until she figured out how to operate her food printer properly, she'd stick to what she knew. She wasn't about to try that swishy stuff, trademark. Their competitors sold. Word around NBP was it contained nanobots that would make you addicted. This is Fractopia, forecasting the facts of tomorrow in the fiction of today. This show is intended for writers, readers, and game masters of near-future science fiction and takes a conservative position regarding upcoming developments over the next 100 years. I'm your host, Todd Foley, and today's episode looks at the food of the future. 
According to United Nations predictions, the world's population will exceed 11 billion by the end of the 21st century. How will we accommodate feeding all those people in the face of a changing climate? It's clear that today's industrial ranching and farming approaches won't be up to the task without increasing the already staggering amount of damage they produce in the surrounding ecosphere. But imminent changes in available technologies are coming for both farming and food production, and they are now entering experimental phases throughout the world. What are the superfoods of tomorrow? And how will we produce a wide variety of inexpensive food for an ever-growing population on an unforgiving earth? Part 1 New Technologies Anyone who assumes that the food production technologies of the coming century will be similar to those of today would be making a huge mistake. The reasons are many. Scientists around the world are working on a slew of new technologies that will affect the way we produce and consume food, and aside from issues of scale and automation, they are being driven by concerns such as human population growth, global climate change, and the devastating environmental cost of modern methods. For these reasons, and thanks to the solutions being put forward to solve these problems, the food production methods of the coming century will be vastly different than those of today. Let's take a look at a few of those emerging technologies. Genetic Modification Farmers and ranchers have been tinkering with the genetic makeup of the plants and animals we consume for thousands of years through the process of selective breeding. That's why modern food sources, such as watermelons, corn, and wheat, bear little resemblance to their wild counterparts. It's a slow process, taking many generations and continuing to this day. But with the advent of genetic manipulation technologies such as CRISPR and others in coming years, our ability to alter the makeup of plants and animals is increasing by leaps and bounds. Here's Bill Nye, the Science Guy. Imagine being the farmer who grows corn that has been genetically engineered so that insects don't eat it. He doesn't have to spray as much pesticide. He saves money, and his crop is nearly chemical free. If you were that farmer, you might want to grow that corn. But what about the effect of that crop on its environment? It can take years for a new organism to have an impact on an ecosystem. Not exactly the pace of business. Now corporations are developing more specialized, more complex strains of species, species that may be resistant to more diseases and more insects. It all sounds too good to be true, is it? Today, we in the West eat a variety of genetically modified foods, including corn, soybeans, canola, papaya, squash, sugar beets, tomatoes, potatoes, and other fruits and vegetables. These modifications are usually striving after two main goals. One, visual appeal, making fruits and vegetables larger, hardier, more colorful, more evenly formed, and harder to bruise. And two, making the plants insect or pesticide resistant, allowing for greater crop yields given the use of industrial farming methodologies. In recent years, genetic modification of animal DNA has led to the development of new GMO species, including salmon, which are engineered to grow larger and faster than their wild cousins. So far, salmon is the only meat product approved by the FDA for human consumption. But recombinant bovine somatotropin, a genetically modified protein-based growth hormone, has been given to cattle in the United States for two decades, increasing their production of milk. Experiments are ongoing with other animal species, such as chicken and pigs, to make them resistant to diseases such as the avian virus and swine flu, and you can bet that eventually these animals will be modified to increase such things as yield, growth rate, nutritional content, and flavor. Vertical Farming 
Inside each of these shipping containers is the equivalent of a two acre outdoor field, right? So if you imagine a two dimensional field, a farm, and then you turn that on its end and you hang that field off the ceiling and rack it 256 times, right? That's what's going on inside these farms. So now you're farming in three dimensions instead of two dimensions. So you can get a lot more food out of a way smaller space. That's Tobias Peggs, co-founder of Square Roots, a New York-based vertical farming company. Like others in this quickly growing market space, he's using urban farming techniques to provide city dwellers with fresh, locally grown organic vegetables. These installations can be easily customized to produce specific desired results. So if you said to me, you know, the best tasting basil I ever had was when I was on vacation in the south of Italy in June of 2006, right? I could literally go back through historical environmental records and find light, temperature, humidity, CO2 level from the south of Italy in June of 2006 and go recreate that environment in my box in Brooklyn in February and grow that same tasting basil for you, right? This is very powerful because if you have these modular farms all over the country, now instead of shipping food like the industrial system does, you ship data, right? Ship the environmental data and grow all of the food locally. It's a very powerful concept. As with the Square Roots project, these structures may be located in the center of town, but some argue it would be better to scatter them around the periphery of the urban area. The reasoning is explained here by Dixon Despomier, Emeritus Professor of Microbiology and Public Health at Columbia University. I, I don't think that you're going to find Wall Street with every other building as a vertical farm. That's ridiculous. And some people have used that as a, as a commentary on the industry that how can you possibly think about insinuating farming inside of a city where the property values are so, so high? You know, you, you're, if you're a developer, you could never make enough money with a vertical farm in New York City. Uh, actually, you could, but you have to put it on the periphery of New York City where the property values go way down because nobody wants to live out there. They all want to live in the middle where all the action is, right? So you put the vertical farms in the periphery. Looks like a regular farm, except that in this case, they're indoors. And now you've got fresh produce pouring into the city every day, maybe 10 minutes worth of transit time from the farm to the table. No matter where they're situated, as technologies advance and we get better at this stuff, it's possible to imagine massive tower structures devoted to both interior and exterior farming in every city, providing food for a substantial portion of the population. As time goes by, more and more of these installations, especially the largest ones, will be managed with the assistance of diagnostic drones and specialized robots. These computerized assistants will crawl or fly around the installation, checking, moving, feeding, and harvesting the crops. Hydroponic and aeroponic growing spaces. The typical vertical farm is a hydroponic, aeroponic, or aquaponic growing system. These are all various ways of growing plants without soil. A hydroponic system grows plants horizontally, either in water or some other medium. But since it requires no soil, these layers of farming medium may be stacked in rows as the farm grows vertically. An aeroponic system uses no solid or liquid growing medium at all, relying instead on organizing the plants vertically and feeding them with mists and nutrient solutions. An aquaponic setup extends beyond that idea to create a small ecosystem, one that involves both plants and fish, as well as other water-dwelling creatures. Aquaponic systems can be set up almost anywhere with clean water and electricity, and their great advantage is that they produce both edible plants and animal protein. In such a farm, waste material from the shrimp or fish in one tank is used to fertilize plants in another. This water is then filtered via organic means and restored to the fish tanks to continue the cycle. Today you can find aquaponic farms in every state of the U.S., 
and their popularity will probably continue to rise as city dwellers become more accustomed to locally grown seafood and greens. As with the farming methodologies described previously, it's possible to imagine aquaponic systems growing to the size of huge dedicated towers, or, in the case of kelp farming, gigantic offshore platforms harvesting tons of seafood and plant matter per day. Cellular Agriculture Cellular agriculture is a new scientific field that uses biotechnology and tissue engineering to produce proteins, cells, tissues, and molecular compounds usually associated with animals. Things like meat, milk, eggs, leather, silk, and bone. From living cell cultures. The most highly anticipated result of this new science is, perhaps obviously, cultured meat. So cellular agriculture is an interdisciplinary field, but there aren't yet any courses or degree programs being offered at a university level, not even a textbook. Academic, peer-reviewed scientific papers are few and far between, but that isn't super surprising because, again, this is a very new field of science that we're building as we go. That's Erin Kim, communications director for New Harvest, one of the few companies today exploring the cutting edge of cellular agriculture research. Advances in cellular agriculture stand to cause major changes in not only food production, but in many other fields as well. Being able to produce meat and other animal products from cell cultures instead of whole animals may require less water and land usage and give off fewer greenhouse gas emissions. Some researchers also believe that this could lead to more customizability across food applications as well as to materials, cosmetics, industrial ingredients, and medicine. Personalized diets. As we move through the coming century, increases in our knowledge of the human genome will give us the ability to perform precise genetic modifications based on individual requirements and contraindications. Genetic modification will lead to common foods being enhanced with particular nutrients or vitamins, making them more nutritious than their predecessors of today. But beyond this, nutrigenetics will enable nutritional specialists and AI consultants to offer healthy eating guidance tailored to each individual based on their DNA. That's right. Thanks to CRISPR and other technologies, it should be possible to order your favorite fruit, for instance, but with 50% more potassium and 15% less fructose, and engineered to increase your body's uptake of calcium or modulate your production of insulin. That's a big deal. and biodegradable packaging. The amount of plastic and non-biodegradable substances in our oceans and waterways has grown to become a huge problem, and one of the main culprits is food packaging. The most common culprit by far is plastic, which comprises over 37% of all food packaging worldwide. We're all familiar with the recycled cardboard and biodegradable materials used for eco-friendly packaging today, and this is an important start, but in the future, this trend will go even further. To help stem the tide of plastic waste, forward-thinking companies today are producing food packaging materials which are not only biodegradable, but edible. These new materials serve the same purpose as your cardboard, plastic, or glass containers, but they break down easily under natural conditions, cause no long-term harm to the environment, and can be safely eaten by humans and other animals. Edible packaging materials are typically comprised of vegetable matter such as bamboo, kelp, algae, and corn. But recent advances have produced a type of light plastic-like material made of casein, a protein found in milk. As we wind our way through the 21st century and into the 22nd, it's certain that eco-friendly packaging techniques will become more commonplace and may even be required by government regulation in some regions. Frugal mothers of tomorrow may tell their children, No dessert until you eat your plate. Part 2. New Foods
A wide variety of unusual processed foods with surprising properties will be developed in the coming years, including novelties like edible spray paint, algae protein snack bars, beer made with wastewater, and even lollipops designed to cure hiccups. Some of these foods will be more efficient or more durable varieties of existing foods. Companies today are already working on ice cream and chocolate that don't melt in warm weather, for instance. But others will be whole new substances with surprising new properties, flavors, and textures. All in one foods. Already, companies like Soylent are creating shakes and powdered food substrates that provide all the necessary nutrients for survival. Based largely on soy and vegetable matter, these all-in-one foodstuffs could provide a cheap and healthy method of feeding large numbers of people easily, though they do leave aside questions of variety and texture. Mock Foods Mock ingredients, especially meats, have already become part of many Western diets. From tofu hot dogs to vegan cheese steaks, most of us are already aware that culinary skill and modern processing methods can often replicate the flavor and mouthfeel of certain meats without actually including any meat at all. This trend will likely continue as food technologies advance and with the addition of new substrates like algae and soylent, whole new realms of possibility will open for chefs and food designers. Diners of the future will enjoy nuts that aren't nuts, meats that aren't meats, and side dishes that will seem like one thing when they're actually made of another. Insect-based foods. Today in non-Western countries, many people eat a diet that includes insect-based proteins, such as crickets and mealworms, and some companies today are exploring methods to move this practice up to an industrial scale. Insect-based food production is a more environmentally friendly practice than raising herd animals for meat, and also a more sustainable one. Of course, it remains to be seen how many people in the West will be comfortable with the idea of eating insect matter, but it does tick all the required boxes, and the planet has an abundant supply. Livestock kind of scales with size and its efficiency, so cows are going to be the worst, and chickens are actually quite efficient for their size because there's been so many decades of research in how you know to cultivate them efficiently, but even better than chickens are insects. That's Julie Lesnick an assistant professor at Wayne University who specializes in the evolution of the human diet with a special focus on insect-based foods. If you want to know about eating bugs, she's your go-to person. They use so much less uh, water and other resources. They naturally like kind of dark and cramped environments. They're much more efficient at turning their feed into food for us. What are the insects that we're likely to use in the future? And why? Currently, crickets and mealworms are both being farmed at facilities just for human consumption. These species are easy to rear and offer nutritional benefits similar to traditionally raised livestock. And so this is, these are the first insects that are really taking home as, you know, uh, Western food insects as opposed to what has most traditionally been done by wild foraging. In the third world, there are people eating insects right now, right? As a, as a casual matter of course, yeah? Absolutely. Billions of people around the world eat insects, mostly in tropical regions. From kind of the Western perspective, insects were only something other people ate. And so it became associated with the primitive. And then you grow up with this disgust that is really hard, can be really hard to overcome. Do you think we'll, we'll get around that problem by, by processing them? In other words, not eating them whole, grinding them up into powders, or using them as a substrate? Or? Yeah, some of the um, first products on the market are actually made with cricket powder, so where they're ground up. It's just 100% ground up cricket, and they can be put into protein bars and things like tortilla chips. And, and how much protein can an insect-based diet provide? Crickets, yeah, 60% of their dry matter is protein. And so... Get quite a bit of protein from them. And this 
scale is very similar to what you see in traditionally raised livestock. Let's say we look 50 to 100 years down the road. What sort of insect-based foodstuffs might we find? I really think that 50 to 100 years down the road that we could really see fast food chains and restaurants and grocery stores having insects as food is a very common item. It's going to take a generation or two of turnover to really see this change. And that's my opinion because of this sort of developmental aspect to our disgust trigger. So if we can start raising kids without that disgust trigger, when kids put a bug in their mouth instead of being like, ew, gross, don't do that, instead of it's like, don't eat that bug, it's dirty, let's do something one that I know was produced at a facility and, and is safe for you to eat. Because we kind of start changing that narrative, then we're going to have a whole generation come up who value insects as food. Sea-based foods. Aside from the flesh of piscids and shellfish, sea-based food sources of the future will include algae, kelp, and krill. These biomasses are not only rich in nutrients and easy to process, but lend themselves easily to the use of scalable farming techniques, both onshore and off. Algae, in particular, is filled with proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, making it a good source of nutritional value. While one generally thinks of algae farms as huge, floating installations in lakes or wetlands, Advanced farming techniques are coming to bear on this industry, making it possible to do the same thing in drier climates, even in the middle of the desert. That's exactly what's happening in New Mexico today, where a company called Iwi is farming algae for people to eat. Here's CNN correspondent Rachel Crane interviewing Rebecca White, Vice President of Operations at Iwi. One of the interesting things about algae that leads to the much more higher yield than traditional crops is actually that we do this year round. With corn, you plant once, you harvest once. Right. But this stuff, we might harvest a single pond as much as two or three times a week. Despite all these qualities that make algae such an attractive crop, it's algae's value as food that's most remarkable. Iwi says this strain is about 40% protein and contains all of the essential amino acids humans need. This is the final product from the farm. This is your green gold right here. Yes, ma'am. Meat has those nutrients too, but it uses up a lot more of our finite resources like water and land, not just for the animals, but to grow their food too. As for other plant proteins, some estimates say that algae can produce seven times the amount of protein that soybeans could on the same amount of land. Yeah, it is just salty, just salty. Can't believe I just did that, but it was... <laughs> Due to cost and yield factors, there's a good chance that algae will form a staple in the diet of the future, especially in poorer regions and among the lower classes, and as a bulk substrate in various types of processed food. Those who can afford it, however, will still probably want to get their protein in animal form, or something like it. Grown meat. As mentioned previously, a growing number of firms are currently working on lab-grown cultured meat, using the techniques of cellular agriculture. In a typical scenario, these cuts are cloned from animal stem cells, which are then modified into replicating muscle tissue, resulting in actual edible meat, but without the cruelty of industrial ranching and slaughtering. The first widely available cultured meat products should be available for mass production by the 2030s, and many are betting it will be a multi-billion dollar industry by the middle of the century. GMO. Using CRISPR and related technologies, Genetic modification will quickly expand to include a wide variety of alterations to plant genomes, allowing new combinations of color, flavor, texture, micronutrients, shelf life, reactivity to other ingredients, and more. In the coming years, not only will a greater variety of meats and vegetables be available due to genetic engineering, 
but foodstuffs may even be modified on the cellular level with specially engineered nanoparticles, giving new properties to old foods, such as enhanced bacterial resistance, leading to longer shelf life, changes in density, fat content or texture, or even time-delayed bursts of various flavors. Part 3. Taking it to the future. So far we've covered a broad spectrum of food possibilities that includes all the necessary nutrients and derives from a variety of sources. To better understand how this all might come together with other emerging technologies, let's take a short trip to the future and imagine how a citizen of 2119 might describe the landscape of food production and consumption. Welcome to Union City. The year is 2119, and the majority of the population eats food derived from high-calorie vegetables, grains, legumes, and super algaes, often created via cellular agriculture and tended in giant domed farms by automated systems. Now these staples are supplemented by a wide variety of natural, processed, and 3D printed foods, modified in all manner of ways, treated with flavorings and chemical processing agents such as emulsifiers, preservatives, and antibiotics, and topped off with cloned proteins. Very little meat is processed directly from animal sources anymore, although far from the cities, one still can find old-school farms and ranches growing and producing food the old-fashioned way. In the domed arcologies, offshore installations, and certain areas of the city, massive sealed farms and vertical farm factories yield an abundance of nutritionally complex foodstuffs from biomass, from fish and krill and insects, to algae and kelp and all manner of vegetables, aided by advanced agricultural technologies and tended by robotic systems. Thanks to cellular agriculture and other modern processing techniques, these core staples can be modified to mimic the flavor, texture, and density of most traditional foods. Most food is grown, cloned, or printed right here within the city in vertical farms or food processing labs. The majority of animal-based protein consumed by metropolitans today is comprised of insect-based proteins and cloned meats grown in massive vat labs. In addition to giant megacorporations providing meat to brand name food distributors and restaurant chains, small meat labs can be found in suburban areas and sprawls alike, often specializing in specific proteins or genoculinary techniques. Nearly all food is genetically modified in one way or another. At root, this is done to decrease production costs and increase the shelf life of perishable products. But modification is also done in order to impart new properties to the foods people eat. Now, of course, it's still possible to obtain what some call naturally real ingredients at a premium price from small artisan shops and distant wilderland outposts, but for the most part, the low cost and other benefits of GMO foods have become matters of simple reality and they cause very little argument or uproar. Specialized 3D printers with onboard heating elements can be used to assemble raw processed nutritional resources into full meals using recipe ware, which can be bought, sold and traded online. And this is the single most common method of food production in the average household. Even a fancy home-cooked meal will include some printed dishes out of sheer convenience. Much of the nutritional matter used by these devices comes from the sea, though it's textured and flavored during assembly to resemble any desired food for which a recipe has been downloaded. These base ingredients can be processed in many ways to yield different textures and flavors. A typical recipe might call for a tube of Nutri-Substrate, for instance, along with a few flavor packets, some water, an emulsifier, and one or two personal preference settings, just enough to make you feel like you're cooking. A few minutes later, bing, your printer delivers a Salisbury steak and fried potato dinner. Food printers come in all sizes, 
from small home appliances, single person or family models, to the large multi-chambered industrial printers seen in fast food hubs, food vending vehicles, auto bakeries, and other commercial installations. The simplest units require you to feed the ingredients into the machine and wash all the parts after each use. But luxury models are not only self-cleaning, but contain a variety of storage compartments for different ingredients, allowing them to serve up completely automated meals at the push of a single button. Molecular recombination and chemical synthesis have made it possible to include all the required proteins, enzymes, and micronutrients needed for survival in a rich compound that can be flavored, printed, and served in a variety of ways. The common term for this food substrate is nutri. It's the main ingredient in most 3D printed recipes and fast foods, and for those on a tight budget, it may at times be the only food material available. Popular forms of pre-processed Nutri-based foods are Nutri-Bars and Nutri-Bevs in recyclable pouches. Basically, these products consist of Nutri with various textures and flavoring added. They are manufactured to be a cheap source of minimal nutrition, and often the packaging itself is edible. For those on the go, automated food hubs with their own menus of corporate branded and patent protected recipes have replaced old-fashioned fast food outlets. These food hubs are common hangouts and are regularly crowded with hungry people, especially in lower class areas. Of course, kiosks and wireless payment systems have replaced human cashiers, and the food preparation, including protein printing, is handled by machines. These machines are not only cheaper than humans, they're cleaner and faster. The cheap but flavorful meals produced at most food hubs are constantly changing with the trends and vigorously protected by copyright law but counterfeit copies of protected recipes may often be found on the black market or downloaded via the dark net. When it comes to fine dining and ambiance, the chatty systems of the food hub are replaced by attentive server robots and AI software. Almost anywhere you go out for a sit-down meal, every table includes its own menu screen, holographic display, or conversational AI order taker and your food is delivered by robotic systems. The actual cooking in most restaurants is done by culinary bots, but that's not surprising since many wealthy people now have one of their own at home. Sure, a few upscale restaurants offer old-timey experiences with human waiters and chefs, but being more expensive to operate, such places are usually found in the trendy fast districts. Of course, not so many people go out to eat as once upon a time. In the Ubicomp zones, it's not really necessary to know how to cook, or even how to use a food printer, since it's common for people to have fully prepared dishes delivered directly to them from one or more local restaurants or kitchens, either via automated cars or airborne drones. Many restaurants and food service partnerships even offer subscription services, which communicate with your personal digital assistant to make sure your meals are delivered to you on time and ready to eat. The range of newly emerging food sources and food preparation technologies is huge, and the people of tomorrow will enjoy a wide variety of options for all tastes, budgets, and health requirements when it comes to nutrition, both literally and figuratively. There's a lot on our plate. Thank you for listening to this episode of Fractopia. I'm your host, Todd Foley, reminding you to comment, like, subscribe, and share. Feeding those important algorithms will help bring the show to a broader audience of futurists and fictioneers. If you're feeling especially warm and fuzzy, please feel free to show your support by dropping a one-time donation at thisisfractopia.com or joining my Patreon at patreon.com slash fractopia. Today's episode included the fiction of Adrian McCauley, underscored by the music of David Sezte, as well as a variety of compositions from the Blue Dot Sessions, which you can check out at www.sessions.blue. Sources and links for further reading 
can be found in the show notes below.